Hello and welcome to PFI Talks, brought to you by Prague Finance Institute, an affiliate of the leading Czech economics research center, Sergei EI. The US dollar has dominated the global finance and commerce for decades. But is the dollar's dominance as the global currency still intact? This and similar questions I would like to discuss with my esteemed guest, Perry Merling, a professor of international political economy at Boston University's Pardew School of Global Studies. Hello, and thank you for joining our podcast, Professor. Happy to be here. So, I think the the first question is obvious. Is dollar or the dollar's dominance as a global currency in any threat, given what has happened recently, especially regarding the weaponization of, of central bank reserves? Well, I... I, you're right that there are um, discontents. There are people who are unhappy with the dollar dominance, but I don't see that the that there is much threat to the dollar dominance, um, and and mostly that's because the source of dollar dominance is not the power of the United States, but really myriad business people making decisions about how they want to organize their organized trade in in the globalized system. Um, and uh, and that that continues to be quite robust as far as I can see. And given the ongoing debate and and the frequency of these debates about the over indebtedness of the U.S. government and all the concerns about like uh, U.S. fiscal policies at the current or 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 debt gearing at the current level being unsustainable, uh, could that be sort of? changing the view of the people who are actually making day-to-day decisions on using dollar for debt transactions and making making savings? Well, um, it, it, people are concerned about that, but but here's another point you have to appreciate, that the global dollar um, is a private dollar. It's it's largely the liability of global, global banks, um, like uh, the private banks um, and not the de- debt of the US government um, or of the Fed. The Fed, the, the central bank of the United States operates sort of indirectly as a backstop to this global system. But it's important to appreciate that the global system is a private dollar money, um, promises to pay dollars, bank deposits, um, not liabilities of, of, the, of the US government. So the credibility of that system kind of depends on the assets of the global banks, not on not on the US government. This is actually opening a question to another sort of a series of questions about the dollar because we seem to be likening dollar with the, with the greenback, but there's obviously a lot more to that because uh, there seems to be as you describe, it could it could be it could be uh, private debt, it could be euro dollar debt markets, for example. So it brings me to that question, which has been sort of set before in various different other forums. But what what is actually dollar? What is it? Well, the the uh, the greenback, as you mentioned, okay, is currency, um, and I have some in my wallet here. Um, there, which is a liability of the Federal Reserve um, and trades one for one with um, other liabilities of the Federal Reserve that are used by banks as as reserves. Um, so banks, commercial banks have deposit accounts, um, American banks um, have deposit accounts at the Fed that they use to make payments to each other. Um, and then, the, but the global dollar system, the euro dollar system, as you were referring to it, um, uh, is banks that have deposits in New York um, at New York banks um, that they use as reserves. Um, so, what counts as a dollar depends on where you are. Um, but they all trace back to this liability of the Fed. They're all they're all directly or indirectly promises to pay the the liability of the fed um but it's it's important to appreciate that this is it's it's basically a credit system these are all promises to pay in one of your discussions about two years ago if i'm mistaken with uh economist zoltan posner you were discussing together the role of petrodollars and it seems like that the global dollar has 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 risen to the prominence by being the primary currency for settling transactions uh, related to crude oil and and then later on all sorts of other um, energy. With the current setup, when there is this sort of a, first of all, talk about um, uh, reducing the 
the dependence on fossil fuels and and also with the with the push of uh, petro states of diversifying their reserves couldn't that be a sort of a uh sort of a in some way a long term death knell for the global dominance of dollar if petro states are not using the dollar for settling transactions for crude oil as much as they used to well that's one good among many um and a, and a particularly important one um you know the a, a lot of the news reports of of the petrostate revulsion um i think are are overdone um the saudi saudi currency is basically pegged to the dollar so um as, as is the rmb you know slightly pegged to the dollar so it's not uh people can use whatever they want um if they're having bilateral uh balanced trade with each other you can you don't have to use the dollar you can use some artificial currency <clears throat> the question is when you have unbalanced trade in what currency are you going to hold your reserves um what uh, that you're going to accumulate what are the what are the surplus countries um willing willing to accumulate um and in that regard i think the dollar uh there's just not much there's not much choice um and uh you may you may sometimes people say it's an american expression that the do the dollar is is the least dirty t-shirt in the drawer um so it's uh but it is the least dirty um and by and by a rather substantial margin um i would um i would point out that the the dollar's um death has has been reported repeatedly um in, including in fact by um by we were talking before we came on my my latest book uh, about Charlie Kindleberger in 1971 when Nixon tried to kill the dollar system he tried to he took the dollar off of gold and he was not happy with you with dollar dominance um in the world but the bankers wouldn't let him they they developed the dollar system um abroad um during the 1970s so there's lessons of history that the dollar system is a lot more resilient um and i would come to the most recent one which is the global financial crisis of 2008 and 9 um was very very much a test of this global dollar system and uh and led to some of these calls uh for uh for replacing it or internationalizing it and having some sort of international SDR or something like that um what ac actually has happened in the last decade though um i would emphasize is the expansion of the dollar system to the global south um largely driven by the zero interest rate policy in the global north so there was a, a expansion of of lending um and uh so the dollar system is in fact geographically larger uh than it's ever been today okay well then let's call them current monetary policy issues uh where do you think we stand in terms of uh, like global uh central banks tightening cycle of interest rates because as you said i mean the in the past uh due to zero interest rates and that era is definitely over uh or at least temporarily now uh where do we stand with the with the with the tightening of interest rates by the US Federal Reserve and other big central banks. Uh well, we're taping this on the 26th of September, so the uh 2023. So uh just last week, the the US central bank um decided to hold steady and not increase interest rates anymore, but the ECB did and and uh and uh, and the uh and the and, and the Bank of England um also st stood pat. Um I think the larger context that needs to be appreciated here is we've had a decade of zero interest rate policy really since the global financial crisis there was an attempt to return to normalcy um uh a little bit the taper tantrum some of your listeners may may remember um and uh, that didn't work very well um and then covid came along and so we went back to zero for a while um so what Powell has been doing in the last year or so is very rapidly moving from zero to five or so percent. Um I I think the the way to understand this um is that it is uh, because covid is is sort of like war finance <laughs> and we're transitioning from uh wartime 
monetary policy to peacetime monetary policy. So it's very similar to what happened after World War II, um, after World War I. You know, the economy is all geared up to produce war goods, and now it has to produce, you know, uh, produce uh, peace goods. It's all geared up to support the government financed war effort. And now it has to gear up for private, you know, private investments. So there's some some uh, slippage in moving, but we, we're moving into the peacetime uh, finance and, and, and to normalcy. I mentioned the behavior uh, that, the, that the central banks are sort of moving together. This is very important, okay, very important to emphasize, again, in light of history, that what, what broke down the dollar system in 1971 was exactly that the central banks were not moving together, um, that, the, that the Federal Reserve in the United States was having very loose monetary policy, um, in, in part an attempt to, uh, to elect R Richard Nixon, um, and, uh, and Germany was having very tight monetary policy, and uh, the consequence was very large short-term capital flows um, that from the United States to, to Germany, which sort of under, undermined the dollar. And it was that that caused uh, Nixon to take the dollar off of gold. Um, so I don't know that it was understood that in a, in a global system, you know, the, the coordination of macroeconomic policies, um, and in particular interest rates, um, is required. Otherwise, you're creating speculative incentives um, for hot money to move to, move, uh, uh, to its highest return. Um, it does seem that we learned that lesson, you know, maybe not in 71, but the fact that the central banks are more or less moving in lockstep, um, some a little faster, some a little slower, um, and some are more tightly integrated with the global system than others. So the outliers that are keeping interest rates very low, you know, are are basically Japan and and I guess China. Um, but there, the, it's it's unclear how long that will last, and capital controls would be necessary in order to in order to maintain that. Most other countries are following the U.S. lead. I don't know to what extent this is actively coordinated, um, but it is it is it is in fact coordinated um, that the central banks are moving are moving together. Um, I emphasize that this is really about I emphasize again that this is really about moving from war finance to peace finance, um, and uh, not so much about fighting inflation. Um, but the inflationary uh, bugaboo um, has given the central banks a little time where they can actually move very aggressively and very quickly. Um, that I think it would be there would be a lot more political pushback um, if there had not been this this post war inflation, as I would call it, um, and uh, which is which at least in the United States is tempering now, um, and uh, but not so much not so much in other countries. Um. Well, I mean. Following the global financial crisis, you know, 2008, but I mean, and, and you actually refer to it in one of your earlier books, The New Lombard Street. Uh, there's this discussion by you about Federal Reserves because of the, uh, as a consequence of the crisis becoming the lenders of last resort, especially the, U the US Fed, which has actually led to their balance sheets, you know, expanding, you know, immensely as well. Uh, could you explain that a little more in detail about what could it mean, especially given the 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 rise of um, uh, you know central bank digital currencies, whether we could sort of like see a a yet another role of of uh, yet another role that central banks could be playing in the in the financial systems? Um, so that earlier book that you mentioned, the New Lombard Street. Um, is from 2011. Um, so that was my book really responding to the global financial crisis of 2008 and 9, which, which was a crisis of the emerging uh, market-based credit system, um, so-called shadow banking, um, that I, I viewed that crisis as a test of the shadow banking system at the, at the time. Um, and so I wanted to emphasize that the international lender of last resort role for that kind of market-based finance is not so much lender of last resort as it is dealer of last resort. Um, so that was the subtitle of that book, How the Fed Became the Dealer of Last Resort, that this mm -hmm. is the form of, of lender of last resort that is appropriate for the new globalized financial, globalized shadow banking system that that was that that had emerged in the previous decade or or two. Um, and it remains so today. Um, what I 
what I did not see yet in 2011 um, was the international dimension, um, was the was the dollar system, that this was not just a crisis of the shadow banking system, it was also a crisis of the global dollar system. And that globalization has these two aspects, the globalization of shadow banking and also the globalization of the dollar. Um, now, 10 years later, I understand international money a lot better. Um, so I, I would put those two together. And I have just recently published a piece about uh, about international lender of last resort that emphasizes how the how the swap lines, the liquidity swap lines that the Fed has with other major central banks, how that backstops the global the global uh, shadow banking system as well. And in particular, it's 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 liquidity swaps with in in yen and and in euro, um, where uh, there there are. You know, commercial foreign exchange swaps, um, which deviate from covered interest parity, interestingly, um, and uh, and but but the but the Fed is creating a backstop for that whole system to keep it to keep, and that's really mostly the offshore dollar system, but the Fed is the Fed is backstopping that indirectly through its liquidity swaps with these other central banks. So it's not lending directly to banks, offshore banks, but it's lending to to central banks that are on can on lend the dollars um, as as needed. So, you know, the story that I that I wanna I want to tell your listeners, okay, is about the growth of the global dollar system and through crises, through responding to crises by by inventing new institutions, new kinds of backstops. Um, and uh, and uh, that that also are politically acceptable, not only not only by the rest of the world, um, as you mentioned in the lead in, um, the rest of the world is maybe not so happy with dollar dominance, um, uh, partly because I think they don't really understand what it what it really is and how it works and where it came from. Okay, but neither are sort of U.S. politicians, you know, very very enthusiastic about that. Um, they uh, so the political. The, there's, it's a delicate balancing act to keep this system uh, alive and keep it evolving as as there are political developments, as there are economic developments. It's a, it's always a work in progress. Um, and Kim, this is I'm taking here um, very much a Kindlebergian sort of uh, uh, approach to this. Um, he didn't he didn't live to see the rise of shadow banking um, or you know these other mechanisms um, the the international liquidity swaps he he knew about the basel swaps um, and he talked about them uh, a lot but the story the story is of a system responding growing through crises okay um, and covid covid was one okay and 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 covid led to a number of new fed facilities um like for example what i what uh, what they call the fema uh, repo facility where the fed is now uh, willing to open its discount window in effect to other central banks its discount window okay not so people who who don't have liquidity swaps okay if they have treasury bills they can bring them to the fed and and get reserves so this was this is a new thing um and uh and 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 uh, uh, will is will now be in place for the next crisis. So we're 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 learning and evolving um, through crises. And hence, you are stressing the fact that that new role of especially the U.S. Fed is that is the money market dealer of the last resort. Well, that that facility, yes, is that. Um, uh, and for for the international money market dealer of last resort, okay. Um, in terms of supporting um, capital markets, I would say the Fed's role is is much more domestic. You know that it is what it did during the global financial crisis was really support the U.S. dollar uh, mortgage market um, in the United States, um, and of course always the market for government debt, um, for treasury treasury debt, um, but not not any wider set in in COVID. There was a little bit of an extension to um, corporate debt. Um, there were some facilities that for the new for for the first time. So it's evolving um, depending on where the stresses in the system are. Um, and uh, that's for for a scholar like me, that's that's sort of fascinating. And I think you need to see it on a long historical timeline to see how the system responded to previous crises so that when you hear, 
you see new developments, you can put them in context and say, how important is this? I've seen this story before. <laughs> and uh, uh, so let's not get too excited about this. Um, and and think of it as the growing pains of the dollar system, not the demise of the dollar system. And if I were to be looking at it from this perspective, should I I shouldn't be concerned about the expanding balance sheet of the U.S. Fed? Well, the Fed that uh, Powell is concerned about that, um, and and in fact, the balance sheet is shrinking, um, has been in the last in the last year or so. Some of these debts are are rolling off. Um, the I think there is a learning curve here for for the Fed trying to understand how to manage this global system, and what it did during a crisis was just to take all of the stuff that was breaking and put it on its balance sheet, thinking that it could easily roll off after, and that that proved not to be so. Okay, so I think we are we are learning about that that when things get on the Fed's balance sheet, it's not so easy to get them to get them off again. Um, what exactly is the right size of of the, of the Fed's balance sheet given its role in the global in the in the enlarging global economy? Um, I I'm not sure exactly we know or how to think about that, um, but um, it is. Uh, it is the world central bank de facto um and uh and it has and it has taken on that responsibility um and that's you know that's good for Czechoslovakia <laughs> it's good it's good for the world um i think that uh there there may be some pushback um in american politics about that um it doesn't seem right now that the politicians have have sort of noticed that um but uh, we'll we'll see. We have an election season coming up, um, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, I'm not sure what will happen. So taking it from the big sort of core uh, uh, core parts of the global financial system into the peripheries, and you referred to Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic and Slovakia, and it's an interesting comparison because Slovakia, former part of the Czechoslovak Federation, is part of Eurozone. It's a five million country, so it's one of the smaller EU countries and one of the smaller Eurozone countries. While the Czech Republic has kept its own currency and it's independent, it's not actually packed, but obviously it's very closely sort of uh, mirroring all the moves on 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 in, on the on the ECB level. But how do you see the current cycle of um, interest rate tightening and it's now? pausing to some extent with the exception of of the ECB how do you see it impacting the periphery smaller monetary markets or systems like the one of the Czech Republic or for example Turkey um well this is what typically happens in a tightening cycle um is that uh the the periphery gets pretty badly hit um as as money retreats to the center um in, in, in metaphorically um the uh uh, as I was saying, one of the most important things that happened um, since the global financial crisis because of zero interest rate policies in the global north is that there was an outflow of money from the global north to the to the periphery. Um, there was easy credit. Um, and many of these countries took advantage of that, um, not only not only for state borrowing, but for borrowing by their national champions, by their by their uh, uh, exporters. Um, I don't. I, I'm not an expert, and I haven't been following what ha what's been going on in in the in the in the Czech Republic exactly. I can't speak as an expert on that, but but certainly um, uh, the even farther out in the periphery, developing countries, emerging markets. You know, there there's a lot of debt problems that are emerging there, and there's going to be a lot of debt restructuring that is is in our future. Um, that as interest rates have gone from zero to to five percent in the north, okay. They've gone from from seven percent to fifteen percent, okay, in the global south, and uh, that's not that's that really that debt burden um, is going to be resolved. So here again, it, I I want to I want to come back to that theme that we're moving from war finance into peace finance. We're moving back to normal um, during the zero interest rate policy. A lot of businesses, a lot of credit was was expanded. Was it was this wise lending? Was this not wise lending? Well, that's what we're testing now. We've moved from elasticity to discipline. 
Um, we we already have seen a number of what I call ZERP businesses, businesses that grew up in the ZERP in the zero interest rate policy regime, um, have proven that they, you know, so we've seen crypto tested and 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 broken. We've seen the Silicon Valley Bank collapse. We've seen so we are testing all in the intensive margin, in the extensive margin, all of this is being is being tested by this new uh discipline, this this uh tightening, this tightening cycle. And then we will see. Um, the the places where credit expanded that it was a good idea will survive and will and will be built on um, in the future. So uh, if I'm right that this is the these are the growing pains of the dollar system, what we're doing is 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 figuring out what part of the growth of the last ten years do we want to hold on to for the next ten years? Okay, and what part proves not to be such a good idea, <laughs> and we don't and we don't want to hold on to it for the next. Uh, years. Um, you mentioned in a previous question, I didn't, I didn't really get to um, CBDC. Mm -hmm. So crypto um, ha grew up, you know, I, it looks to me like a lot of that is a ZERP business. Okay. And is, is going away. Okay. The central bank response to crypto is, was to try to develop um, the central bank digital currency. It was really, I think, more of a response to the initiatives of Facebook, for example, trying to create its own digital currency um, inside inside the platform of Facebook, um, which seemed, I think, to the central bankers, much more of a threat than Bitcoin. Okay, and uh, and so stablecoin is uh, that's that that sort of and and decentralized finance and so forth during during the the pandemic um grew into a very large thing and then as interest rates rose terra collapsed and 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 other tether and were under under challenge we're we're seeing the, this is part of the return to discipline uh in in the center um and testing the connections between the ability of the of the crypto stable coins to actually maintain par with the dollar system um and uh, and that's that's happening everywhere in 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 the world intensive margin and extensive margin everywhere so that's a frame for understanding the time the times that we're living in um and they're 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 perilous times. They're dangerous times, but they're also from a monetary, for a monetary economist, they're interesting times too. Um, and you learn, you know, this is, you know, you learn what's working and what's not working. Where, where, what parts of the system are most fragile and what parts are robust? We can guess, but the only way you can really find out is by going through a process like this, because the system is so interlinked that it's not really clear where where the weak parts are um and we're and we're going to find them things are going to break more things are going to break um but i don't think the system itself will break um these new these new facilities that i mentioned on the fed's balance sheet i believe the fed has confidence in them okay that they will the system itself the core of the system is secure okay and will not break um and uh but but the periphery and and peripheral activities um, that are in the United States, you know, will break. Um, and uh, and that's part of the point is to is to, as I say, get rid of the extensions that turn out to be bad ideas um, and then start again from a more solid base. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's sort of organically what's happening in the world right now. I'm sorry. I'm. 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 I'm not more. I can't say more about the Czech Republic. Um, don't. Don't worry. I'm, that's. Uh, yeah. That's absolutely fine. Uh, but what you've been saying, because what when I've been sort of preparing for our, you know, for our discussion and 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 reading your books before, I mean, you've been known for what. what and correct me if I'm no, not describing correctly. Renowned for this so-called money view approach to like gauging the economy. Uh so. You're looking at it obviously from a financial perspective or fa finance perspective, uh, and obviously, of the more you know, when we're looking at the modern economy, financial systems are very critical to it. But can you be a little more specific about sp about the, the money view approach? Because obviously, you've discussed it, we've talked about it up until now in the podcast. But can you be a little more specific about this approach? How are you looking at the economy? Well. Um the the money view is what I call so I for for many years I was developing a course at Columbia University 
uh, at Barnard College, where I was for 30 years, I was teaching, um, that got turned into um, an online course um, on for Coursera that that is now visible across the world and has had half a million people take it. It's free. Um, was filmed by um, the Institute for New Economic Thinking in the fall of 2012 um, in New York, and, and it went live in the fall of 2013, and it's still up there. Um, that course is, you know, if you wanted to learn the money view, that's what you have to do. It, it, it It's 10 years out of date a little bit. So some of the facts about the world that I say there are not facts anymore. Um, but the way of thinking about money, okay, is I think held up pretty well. And so there are two pieces of that that I would emphasize, okay. Um, one is understanding banking as a payment system. Um, so paying attention to settlement as a disciplining feature um, that is that helps keep the global system uh, coherent. Um, that is that feature of the system, settlement, um, is sort of abstracted from in most of economics and most of finance too. There is a kind of assumption of a frictionless surface, perfect liquidity, um, that, that has been a useful idealization for developing finance theory and, and economic theory, but turns out to be abstracting from something that's quite important for the modern day. So banking as the payment system um, is the first thing that I emphasize. And the second thing that I emphasize is banking as a, as a market-making system, um, that, that the liquidity of, of of, uh, of financial assets, including money market assets, okay, is a product of a profit-seeking uh, dealer system that are are quoting bid ask spreads and 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 making markets. Um, and so, in order to understand where liquidity comes from in the modern shadow banking system, which is money market funding of capital market lending, you need to look at the dealer system. Um, becomes much more important in market-based credit than it than it was before. Um, and uh, those those two features of of the of the world have largely been that second feature also has largely been abstracted from in in economics and finance both. Um, and uh, there is concern often in finance about market efficiency and the dealer system. But but thinking about the global thinking about global money as a dealer system, this is this is specific to the money view that I mentioned. Um, I should say, so I developed this way of, of, of understanding money in teaching students in, in Manhattan who all wanted to go work downtown um, in Wall Street. Uh, and so they were motivated. They were very interested in, in, in learning about this. Um, and I, uh, that was also when I was learning finance. My, you mentioned my, my third book, New Lombard Street, but before that was, was, was Fisher Black. Um, which was a history of the rise of modern finance. So I I was in an unusual position that I knew modern finance, but I also knew knew uh, monetary economics. Um, and so shadow banking is uh, I came to believe uh, money market funding of capital market lending. So it's both. It's it's where monetary economics meets finance, um, and uh, and that's why it proved so difficult for most people to understand in 2008 because they were either in the finance world or they were in the money world but you needed to be in both okay in order to understand what was happening i think that's largely understood now 10 years later um but it is uh i i, I happened because i was just in the right place at the right time and and responding to the interests of students um i had educated myself about this emerging market based credit system um, and, uh, and, and so was in a position to then, so INET decided to just tape that course, um, and give it away. Um, and, uh, so I, I don't think it's been translated in subtitles for Czech, but there are, there are Chinese subtitles. There's versions of it in mm -hmm. other, in other languages, um, on, on Coursera. And actually all the video is also on my website too, um, which professors sometimes, will just use some of that in their class. Um, it's all it's all in the public realm. Um, and uh, that's that's what the Institute wanted. Um, and uh, and and so I think they were surprised that it proved to be so popular. This was an upper level economics course, okay, at Columbia University. And uh, but most of the people who take it, um, work in banks or in the finance industry in some way. They're practitioners and they're lawyers and they're computer scientists and and they're IT people. 
and they and they feel like they they work for a bank they better know something about banking and and they are some of the most satisfied customers of this of this uh, of this course and that's what the learning and education should be all about you you mentioned that you know one of your books when you actually put on a cap of a economic historian if i if if i may put it this way and 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 the book that that you published if if i'm not mistaken that came out last year and it's and it's and it's a book when a when an economic historian like you writes a biography about another economic historian and 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 you meshed it with the uh with the with the with the look at the um financial systems and well i should say the charles kinderberger and that's the book titled money and empire uh is is a more financial historian rather than economic historian and um but charles kinderberger has been sort of pivotal in his role and 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 his book about manias and panics and crises uh you know has served as a backrock for understanding financial markets so what i'm actually really interested about is like that i know that you took about 10 years to write that biography of uh, charles kinderberger or about that time so what did you really learn during that time writing it or working on it or how long did it actually really take you to sit down and write it that's what i wanted to ask that's well I start I started it the book um I tell in the preface to the book a little bit about about where how the book came to be um and um I when I finished New Lombard Street and it was published in 2011 um I read the book and I said you know there's a big problem with this book <laughs> this this uh this financial crisis wasn't just a test of the shadow banking system it was a test of the global dollar system and that's really not in the book because the book new lombard street is sort of a biography of the fed so it's looking from inside the united states and so i said i really need to do this book again but as a biography of the dollar so the global dollar system and that's so i started that um after a year or two i discovered kinderberger and i said that's what that's what i'm going to hang the whole story on so the book is intended to be in fact the most important thing for me as a scholar was was that it's a, it's a it's a revisionist history of the evolution of the dollar system um and uh where where it came from how, how the global dollar system came to be um and the great thing about hanging this story on kindleberger is that the dates are almost the same you know that he was born in 1910 okay the fed was born in 1913 Okay. He 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 was a, a a student at Columbia University as the sterling system was breaking down 1931 when sterling went off gold okay and he moved to MIT as a professor in 1948 shortly after Bretton Woods so his his the arc of his life and the arc of the dollar system are are kind of parallel um and he he was a student of the dollar system um he was very worried that nixon had killed it in 1971 and that there might be a return to great depression as there had been in 31 when 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 sterling went off gold his story about the world in depression his famous book is that that is the key the pivotal moment when the international monetary system basically broke apart and and was not put back together again until after world war 2 and that's what led to the great depression that's his that's his story so i'm telling and so i wanted to tell the story of the rise of the dollar system but it is also a biography a proper biography of kindleberger i would say an intellectual biography it's about it's about his work about the evolution of his thinking um there's some personal things in there but but what i'm interested in is the evolution of his of his thinking and i guess the third story that's in that book is the evolution of his thinking by contrast to the evolution of international monetary economics sort of standard you know mundell fleming which came up during that period mundell was a student of kindleberger's um and to some extent deviated from him and they had fights about this and and other students who and e- economics as uh as you may know from the history um the economics profession cheered the move to flo- flexible exchange rates imagining that that was a good thing charlie did not okay he thought that would 
that would uh, undermine the global system. And in the 1970s, we learned that flexible exchange rates are not so great as as some economists thought. So it's a story. It's a three. It's it took 10 years because there's three stories <laughs> there, which which each one has its own. And then I had to intertwine them, you know, and make sure that the book wasn't too long. So it takes a lot longer to write a short book than to write a long book. Um, and so that's that's why it took it took a while. Uh, also, other things in my life distracted me. I had to learn international monetary economics. Um, and and I created the MOOC and I, I mean other things. And I moved from Columbia to Boston University. So here I am. And uh, uh, but now it's done, and that makes me happy. And so my next book that I'm working on now is is really to remake to remake the MOOC, to remake that the 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 class. Um, but now by bringing in the global features at the very beginning, and to maybe write a book instead of instead of instead of requiring people to go through you know. 24 hours of video in order to learn the money view um which some people will and and it's it's some people have uh, a lot of people have but i think that it it needs to be a book and so that's what i'm doing that's so, my so now you're working now. your next book will be the book version of that coursera course on, yes, on money view yes but updated updated and including much more international stuff um maybe i'll call it something like how money works or something like that um you think that's a good title Yeah, that sounds how money works. How money works. Yeah. Yeah. What does money do? What does money do? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. How can well that I was again thinking about the subtitle. So how can you lose and win money? But that that now that's 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 it's not know. a it's not an investment book. Okay? It's not an investment it's, book, exactly. It's not an yeah. investment book. It's it's about it's about the internet it's about what I care about. It's about the international monetary system. Um and 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 it's also about um, how different countries um, interact with that international monetary system. I think that's an important new dimension that's not really in the MOOC. You know, where um, that depending on where you are in this international system, your interface with the global system is going to be different, You're, and the challenges you you face. So the the problem that the United States faces is just completely different from that that the the challenge that the Czech Republic faces. Um, which is also completely different than the problem that Venezuela faces. So there that that we do not want, you know, a a standard model that is applying that is that is supposed to be applying to all countries um because the countries are at different positions in this global system. So there the challenges they face and the tools they have at hand to to confront them, you know, are are different. One of the reasons I moved to to Boston University here, the Pardee School, as you mentioned in the intro, is because they're very interested in the problems of the global South. Um, and for 30 years, I was in Manhattan. And so I could see very clearly the problems at the very core of the system, but not very clearly any anything farther from that. So I realized that in order to advance my own thinking, I had to get away I had to get away from the core of the system, wow. and and so that's what I'm very interested in right now. I am interested in thinking about the challenges of Turkey and Czech Czech Republic, um, and and of the global South. That's that's my learning curve um, that I want to put in this new book. That's a that's a new way of looking at overcoming the two one two the area code of Manhattan syndrome. You know that um, a lot of people who lived like myself for some time. Um, on Manhattan, you know, had, you know, in some way have to overcome because the world is not just Manhattan. And while you on Manhattan, it seems like it is. And going back to the title, I think what money does is better than what my, you know, how money works. Because okay, how money works imply putting it at work, you know, and that's sort of a how to invest. Anyway, uh, that's my two cents to that. Well, on that happy note, I'm I'm very much grateful to you for joining us for this podcast. So. Thank you very much. And this has been an amazing talk with Professor Perry Merling. So thank you and goodbye and see you next time. Thank you, Lars.